So as I was saying before the break, uh, stall is a very dangerous situation and you have to be uh, very careful and even with all the uh, precautions taken to prevent stall, still uh, accidents happen due to stall. And uh, let, I would like to talk about a recent accident. This was in 2013. So it was almost a year ago and a Boeing 747 aircraft crashed in Afghanistan and there is a video of that accident. Uh, so I wasn't sure whether I should show this video in class or not because it's very difficult to watch. So it's, you, you see the, the, uh, the impact of the aircraft with the ground and uh, maybe I shouldn't show this in class but this is very related to our uh, topics. So this is very, in fact, it's very related with the the problem I asked in the exam in your first midterm. Uh, so let me play the video. So this is the real video, by the way. It's not a computer generated uh, video or something like that. So this is a real video li uh, taken by the camera in this car. This is not correct, by the way. The actual date of the accident is um, April 29. Uh, so let me play the video. Okay, so you see the aircraft taking off. And it stalls at that point. And then once it stalls, the pilot loses control of the aircraft and it eventually crashes to the, gr to the ground. Um, so this was a cargo aircraft. It was carrying cargo and there were seven people on board and all of them died, uh, unfortunately. Um, so it's it starts taking off as a like a normal flight and uh, clearly something is wrong here and you can tell from the video it's not easy to see but it has a very high angle of attack and it, it really stops at, in the air for a moment and the pilot loses control and it just crashes. Uh, so let's talk about this and let's see what happened actually and what caused the aircraft to crash. Okay, um, so by the way, as far as I know, the official accident report hasn't been released for this accident. So, uh, the official reason for the accident hasn't been explained yet, but there are several uh, explanations and I think this is most probably the case. Um, So let's use this image. Okay, so this is the aircraft we saw in the video. Uh, so let me draw our forces here. Uh, <clears throat> so it has lift and drag forces. So let me just put them here. Let this be the, uh, the total aerodynamic force, R. So we have lift and drag component. And it has a weight, obviously. And in most cases, the center of gravity is ahead of the center of pressure, okay? So the center of gravity in most aircraft, in most flights, should be in front of uh, the uh, center of pressure. This is our CG location and the center of pressure. And uh, to balance the pitching moment, the horizontal tail should be providing a downforce, right? So that the moment with respect to the center of gravity should be zero. So this is how... Uh, the forces should look like in, an, in a normal flight. So what happened in this case is uh, <coughs> the aircraft is taken off from Afghanistan, right? And in this case, uh, most aircraft try to climb as quickly as they can because it's considered a hostile territory and there can be some threats from the ground. There may be people waiting on the ground to shoot at the aircraft. So to escape from such threats as quickly as possible, they climb as, as quickly as they can. <coughs> so they climb with a very high angle, and the flight path angle is really steep, 
and uh, they just try to uh, get away from the ground. Uh, so what happened in the in this accident is the aircraft was carrying uh, armored vehicles. Uh, so the inside the the aircraft there were such a vehicles. Um, in fact, it says it can carry a maximum of five of these vehicles, and each of these vehicles. Uh, is about 16 tons, so they are quite heavy. And as you see, they are secured with some uh, straps. They are strapped down uh, to the aircraft so that they don't move. Uh, but due to whatever reason, uh, it may be related with having a very high, very steep climb angle. Um, uh, the, the straps broke. They just snapped. And since they broke, the, the, these vehicles shifted backwards as the aircraft started climbing. Okay? And when that happens, um, this, the weight vector goes backwards, right? It comes somewhere here. Uh, and when that happens, to, um, to maintain the flight path angle, the, the horizontal tail force should be adjusted accordingly. Okay? So if the new weight vector is here, then uh, the horizontal force vector should be upwards, such that it balances the pitching moment. But if the shift is too much, if this, the shift is too, uh, uh, the shift is very large, then obviously after a certain point, the horizontal tail force cannot balance the pitching moment anymore, right? In the exam, I ask you to calculate uh, the most forward CG location, but you can also find the most backward CG location. And in this case, uh, this CG shifted so much that the horizontal tail couldn't uh, balance the pitching moment anymore. So what happened then is, uh, since now the, the weight vector is here, and this cannot balance the um, cannot balance the uh, the pitching moment anymore. There will be an unbalanced moment in this direction, right? And the aircraft uh, nose goes high, so the angle of attack increases. Once the angle of attack increases, it reaches the stall angle. So if the originally if the the angle of attack was somewhere here. Due to the unbalanced pitch up moment, it increases, it reaches the stall point, and it even exceeds that. And you can actually see that in the video. The aircraft nose is very high. And since uh, the lift coefficient value is so high, the drag coefficient increases together with that due to this relation. When you have a very large CL coefficient, there will be a very large drag coefficient. And very large drag coefficient means that uh, the, the thrust you, force you have from the engines cannot uh, keep the speed anymore. So the aircraft starts slowing down. And as a result, uh, you lose lift force, you lose a thrust force. And <coughs> that's uh, how the accident happens. So let me just take it back. So at this point, even from this view, we can see that uh, uh, the aircraft is, uh, the speed is very low. And in fact, it just stops there for a while, right? It stops there for a while and then starts uh, going down. And when the aircraft stops, then the pilot has no controls whatsoever, right? Because the, normally the pilot has the elevators, ailerons, rudders, but none of them works when the aircraft stops, right? The, you, be, you just need an airflow around them so that you can uh, deflect that airflow and you can get a moment to rotate the aircraft. But when you have none of them, the pilot has no controls whatsoever. And this accident was actually inevitable. I mean, um, if the reason of the crash is what I just explained, which is most probably the case, um, And if CG exceeded the, the most allowable uh, aft limit, then the horizontal stabilizer cannot balance it. And then you 
the aircraft stalls, and after it stalls, then you can't really do anything. Uh, okay, so do you have any questions? Okay, now let's continue with our equations. Uh, so in the previous example, we just used the lift equation, right, for calculating the stall speed. Uh, we only used this part, this equation. Uh, so let's take a look at the second equation as well. This the, the, the drag equation. And in the CD, the drag coefficient, if I put in the drag polar expression, now there's a connection between the lift equation and the drag uh, equation. Now I have CL here, okay? But instead of CL, I can insert um, this expression, right? Uh, because for this steady level flight condition, the lift coefficient value should be equal to this uh, expression. So let me just do that. Let me take this and insert into the drag equation. So this is what I have, the drag equation, and I uh, have this term coming from the weight is equal to lift equation. Uh, so this equation shows the drag force, the aerodynamic drag force on the aircraft during a steady level flat condition. Okay, and if the 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 altitude of the flight determines the air density, which appears here and also here and the, the flight is taking place at a certain constant velocity and you put in that constant velocity num value here and also here and uh, you can calculate the drag force using this relation okay so let's now uh, take a look at an example and let's make some calculations so let's go to an aircraft which has a weight of 6000 newtons so it's a small aircraft and the air density is 1 kilogram per cubic meters. Uh, wing surface area is 10 square meters. And let's say that we are given these values. This is the parasite drag coefficient, which is this value here, CD0. And K is this thing. So this, the, the total thing is uh, what we call K. So let me just write it here. So this is K. Okay, and let's assume that the aircraft flies at 30 meters per second. Um, so if you put 30 into the weight is equal to lift equation, it turns out that the lift coefficient should have a value of 1.33. And if the lift coefficient has that much value, then the drag coefficient from this relation uh, turns out to be 0 0.2. Um, so if you put this, uh, these values into drag equation, uh, this is the drag coefficient composed of two parts. So it, you can divide the total drag force into two parts. So this is the parasite drag force, and this is the induced drag force. <coughs> and for the uh, for this case, if you put the numbers, it turns out that the Parasite drag force is 90 newtons, and the induced drag force is 800 newtons. And the, the total drag force is then the sum of these two, right? It's 890 newtons. Okay, and... So, okay, so you can put them here. So then, let's make, put these numbers on a plot. Uh, the horizontal axis is velocity, flat velocity. The vertical axis is the drag force. The total drag force is 890. And we can show the two components of drag force separately. So this is the force due to parasite drag. And the drag force due to induced drag. This is the, the total of the two drag forces.
So that was a power outage in the class while I was working on this uh, example and we had to stop. So now I'm continuing from there. Um, okay, so I was talking about this problem and <coughs> we started with a certain case where this flight speed was 30 meters per second and it's a steady level flight as uh, mentioned here. So at this, uh, for this particular aircraft flying at this particular speed, uh, we, find, we can find the lift and drag coefficients as uh, this is our lift coefficient and the total drag coefficient is this much and from here we calculated the actual drag force uh, in terms of Newton's the dimensional uh, real drag force now we can actually put these values on graphs so the, we, the numbers we have found are valid for one flight speed so let me just make these plots as functions of velocity, okay? So the horizontal axis in all these plots is velocity, except for this one. This is the drag coefficient. Uh, so I found the value for 30 as this much for the lift coefficient. Remember, this was the lift coefficient. The total drag coefficient was this much, 0 0.2. And if you find the ratio of these two, 132 divided by 0 0.2 is it's, uh, it's 11.15. I think, right? No, I think it's this one. I'm sorry. Um, so they multiply this by 5, so it should be this value, okay? And you put it here, the horizontal axis is velocity, the vertical axis is, is lift to drag ratio, CL over CD, it's this much. And um, if you put this number here, the CD value is 0 0.2 and CL value is 1.33. Okay, so these are all single dots on these um, plots. Next, let's calculate all these values for a different flight speed. And the new speed is 50 meters per second. Okay, so the calculations are exactly the same. Uh, on, it's only that instead of the previous speed of 30, I insert 50. And for this new speed, I find a new lift coefficient, 0.48. And I put that in here, and I obtain a new drag coefficient, which is this much. And from here, I can find the, the two components of the drag force, the parasite drag force and induced drag force. And these values are 250 uh, for the, the, drag, the parasite drag force and 288 newtons for the induced drag force, the total becoming this number. And the, these points... <coughs> Current, uh, all these values become the second point on our plot, okay? So the new CL value is 0 0.48 for the corresponding to the 50 meter per second flight speed. And uh, the drag coefficient is 0 0.40, uh, I think it should be 48, so let me correct that, it should be 48. And so this is our second point on this graph. And if you uh, calculate the ratio, no, this is the drag coefficient, right? The drag coefficient is 0 0.4043. Okay, so this, this shouldn't be 40, it's 43. So anyway, uh, and if you calculate the ratio of the two, 0 0.48 divided by 0 0.043, uh, the ratio is this much, so this uh, becomes the second point on our graph, and we can do this for many different velocity values, right? So we are starting from a, a, an initial or the lower velocity value. I can calculate this for a number of velocity points up to a certain limit, and if I combine all these data points, all these uh, data will become uh, plots. Okay, so let me scroll down, and in fact, I have done that before, so let me show you the data for that. Uh, so at 30 meters per second, I had this much uh, lift coefficient, and as the flight speed increases, the necessary CL value decreases, okay, which is very uh, reasonable. If we, If you remember the equation, from which we calculate those lift coefficients. Uh, 
um, yeah, it, it changes inversely with the square of the speed. So as the speed increases, then the CI value decreases, and the plot shows exactly that. Okay, and if you plot CL versus CD, which is the drag polar, you get this data here. Okay, so this corresponds to the lower flight speed, 30 meters per second, as the aircraft starts going flying faster. Uh, both CL and CD values uh, reduce, they decrease, and you obtain this plot. Uh, <coughs> similarly, you can plot. Uh, drag coefficients as a function of flight speed. Uh, CD0 is a constant, it's a constant parasite drag coefficient, so this doesn't change no matter what the flight speed is, this always stays fixed at, at this number. However, the induced drag coefficient depends on uh, the CL value, which changes according to this. So if you uh, put the, the, these CI values into the induced drag coefficient, you get these red points for the induced drag coefficient. Uh, if you look at here, at lower speeds, the induced drag coefficient is much larger than the, the parasite drag coefficient, and at a certain speed they become equal to each other, and above that speed limit, um, the induced drag coefficient becomes smaller than the parasite drag coefficient, so this is pretty typical of uh, for all um, conventional aircraft. And if you look at, look at how the lift to drag ratio changes with speed, this is what you get. Uh, at the 30 meter per second, the ratio was this much, and at 50, we obtained a ratio of 11, sl slightly larger than 11, and then it starts going down again. Okay, so if you um, look at here, the lift to drag ratio makes a peak at a certain speed. Which, is, which happens to be here, and if you are flying at other speeds, then this ratio is smaller. Uh, so this is, in fact, the most important plot of all these things. So what is plotted here is the actual drag forces, the dimensional forces with the units of Newtons. If you plot these, uh, these values as a function of speed, this is what you get. Um, um, what you see here are the uh, the parasite drag force component, the induced drag force component, and the sum of these two. Okay? Uh, so similar to what you see here, at low speeds, the parasite drag force is um, small. That's because the parasite drag force uh, coefficient is small with respect to the, the induced drag coefficient. And in, when you look at the dimensional data, you see uh, the same thing. At low speeds, you have a large induced drag force. As the flight speed increases, um, the parasite drag force starts increasing, but the other one starts decreasing. Okay? At certain point, they intersect, they become equal to each other, and if the flight speed keeps increasing, then um, the, the parasite drag force becomes larger than the, uh, the induced drag force component. Okay, again, this is very typical of uh, aircraft for all conventional, in fact, for most conventional aircraft as well. You will have such a relation between the drag force and the flight speed. Okay, again, keep in mind that all of this is valid for the steady level flight condition. So only for that flight condition, uh, what you see here really makes sense. So each one of these dots here, so every point on these uh, on these uh, curves correspond to a, a steady level flight condition. Okay. So for example, the the data you see here are built for the 40 meter per second uh, steady level flight at a certain altitude. Right. The the altitude is all constant in all of these calculations. <coughs> so if you fly your aircraft at 40 meters per second, then this is how much Present drag force your aircraft experiences, and this is the amount of the induced drag force. The total drag force becomes this. <coughs> okay. Um, good.
good. Now, um, uh, let's talk about the concept of required trust. Uh, so, required trust is a very important concept in aircraft performance. So, let me just read the definition from here. Trust required is defined as um, the, the trust necessary to maintain the given flight condition. And we're talking about a level, said level flight. So, to maintain the given flight condition means if to maintain the given speed and altitude of the flight. Uh, how much thrust force you, your aircraft requires is uh, defined as the thrust required. It depends on the velocity, altitude, shape, size and weight of the aircraft. And it has nothing to do with the engines. So let me uh, explain what I mean by this. Uh, uh, so for the steady level flight condition, the required thrust is equal to drag force, right? So the, the amount of thrust your aircraft requires is equal to the drag force, aerodynamic drag force acting on the aircraft. And the, the, uh, the aerodynamic drag force depends on all these things, right? It depends on the velocity because it depends on uh, dynamic pressure. Obviously, it depends on velocity. It depends on the altitude because the air density is, uh, is a factor in the drag equation. It depends on the shape, size and weight of the aircraft. Uh, the shape, size are obviously important because the drag coefficient is determined uh, for uh, these things. And the weight of the aircraft is important as well, because if you look at the drag equation, you see the weight of the aircraft uh, in the equation coming through the induced drag components, right? Uh, so for induced drag, you need CL squared, but instead of CL, you can insert this expression, which in includes the weight of the aircraft. So your drag, aerodynamic drag force uh, depends on the weight of the aircraft as well. Again only for the steady level flight condition, okay? So this is true if you want to maintain your altitude and speed. For any other flight condition, that, does, that doesn't have to be the case. Okay, um, so this is how trust required is defined. Uh, so the reason I say here that it has nothing to do with engines is uh, somehow you need to supply this much thrust force to be able to fly in that given flight condition. And it, the aircraft doesn't care where that thrust force comes from. So it can be coming from a propeller, it can be coming from a jet engine, or it can be even coming from a rocket. So you may have rockets installed on your aircraft, and if those rockets provide that thrust force, that's okay. You, you will be able to continue your flight. It does, so what I'm saying here is this has nothing to do with the type of the engine you have on the aircraft. Okay? It doesn't matter what the source of the thrust force is. You need this much thrust force to maintain that flight condition. Uh, okay. So let's uh, again take a look at these equations. I'm just going to repeat the same things I did before. This is the weight is equal to lift equation. From here, I obtain this expression for the lift coefficient. And then I go to the drag force equation. And then instead of the lift equation here, I insert this uh, thing here within parentheses here. And from here, uh, this is what we get. This is the, um, the parasite drag force component which depends on V squared, proportional with V squared. This is the induced drag component, but if you look at the expression here, you have V squared within the parentheses here, and the, you have the square of that parentheses. Uh, so you have V to the power 4 here, and you have this V squared coming from outside the parentheses. So the, this square term cancels the 4 here, and that becomes 2. So you have uh, V squared on denominator. This is what you get in the end. Uh, so here you clearly see the, how these two components of um, drag force changes with speed. The first component 
is proportional with the square of the speed, and the second component is inversely proportional with the square of the speed. Okay, so this explains the um, the plot we obtained earlier. So this is the industrial force component, and the precise force component is shown with blue. Remember, this is proportional with the square, so that means you have this parabolic uh, curve, which increases as the flight speed is increased. But the second term is inverse proportional, so that means as <coughs> you increase the flight speed, then uh, this decreases with um, uh, its uh, the square of the flight speed. Okay. And this is uh, a plot I, uh, I found on the internet, um, <coughs> basically showing the same thing. So this is the form drag or the parasite drag, it increases quadratically, and the other one is reduced as the speed is increased. And what really the interesting here is if you add the two, you get this shape. Okay, so this is the actual, the total drag force is this curve here. So it's interesting to note that uh, no, normally, it's natural to expect that if you fly faster, you need to supply more thrust force. And this part is uh, uh, is natural, I think. So this is uh, in accordance with our um, intuitions. However, this part is not quite so. So if you, if you are flying at this speed, and if you reduce the speed of the aircraft, so here you're flying at a slower speed, and yet your engines need to provide more thrust force. So this is uh, oppo opposed to our intuitions, but that is the case. So if you want to fly very slowly, and for flying very slowly, you need to supply more thrust force. And that's because to be able to fly very slowly, you need to have a very large lift coefficient. And having a very large lift coefficient means that you will have a very large induced drag coefficient and that's why you need uh, the drag force becomes larger for uh, lower flight speeds. Okay, so this curve is uh, becomes very important in a lot of different performance calculations as we will see in our future lectures. Okay, now uh, as you see here Um, there's a certain point where the required thrust force or the drag force becomes minimum, right? So if you are flying very slowly, you need a large drag force or not large thrust force, or if you are flying very fast, again, you will need a large uh, thrust force. But if you are flying at the right speed, then the required thrust, which is equal to the drag force, will become minimum. Okay? So let's see what this point corresponds to. So what is specific about this point, or how can we find this point? Uh, so obviously this is a very nice point, right? Because this, at this point you will need the minimum, uh, the trust, required trust force becomes minimum. Uh, so naturally, while flying at this point, you need the minimum amount of thrust from your engines, that means your fuel consumption will be minimum in terms of fuel consumed per uh, per time, per unit time. Uh, so it's important to know uh, what this condition corresponds to. Okay, now let's take uh, a look at that. Uh, the thrust force, this point can be calculated as the point where the variation of required thrust with the flight speed becomes zero. Right. So to f if you want to find this point analytically, what you need to do is you need to find the expression for this curve, which is the thrust required uh, curve, and you differentiate it with respect to V, and then you, if you equate that to zero, you find this condition. Okay. So let's see what uh, where that condition comes from. Okay. <coughs> So thrust required is equal to the drag force, but drag force is equal to uh, the, this, the dynamic pressure times wing surface area times the drag coefficient, okay? And 
At the same time, this equation should be satisfied as well. Weight is equal to the lift equation. And in the lift equation, you have the same Q infinity times S. So this is the same thing as this quantity here. And instead of the drag coefficient, we have the lift coefficient. Okay, so here's what you do. Uh, from this relation, you uh, write Q infinity times S as weight of the aircraft divided by the lift coefficient. Okay, so you basically pull this thing from this equation. And then, you insert this value into, instead of Q infinity times S in this expression. And that gives you the following. Uh, that gives you the required thrust force as weight over CR times CD. And if you rearrange the terms here, you can also write this as weight divided by CL over CD ratio, okay? And CL over CD is equal to L over D, okay? Um, let's see if I can... So let me just clear this for a while. Um, so you have CL over CD ratio. If you multiply this with 1 over 2 rho, I'm sorry, rho uh, V squared S, and if you divide it by the same amount, rho V squared S, uh, so this part is equal to 1, so you're multiplying this ratio with 1, so it doesn't change the value. Um, but this now multiplication becomes lift force, and the other one becomes drag force, so this becomes L over D. Uh, so this means CL over CD is the same thing as L over D, okay? Okay, so the required thrust is um, equal to the uh, weight of the aircraft divided by L over D ratio. Okay, so um, for this value, for the required thrust value to be minimum, uh, this is constant, okay, so at the moment we assume that the weight of the aircraft doesn't change, okay, so the, uh, the aircraft has a certain weight and it, it is constant, and if you want the, the required thrust to be minimum, <coughs> then L over D ratio has to be maximum, okay? Uh, so, in other words, if you come up here, this point corresponds to the uh, the maximum L over D ratio. So at this point, L over D is maximum. Okay. Now, let's think about how we can find the condition at which the lift over drag ratio becomes maximum. Okay, so let me just insert a new page here. Um, so let me just, before that, let me just read through here. For required thrust to be minimum, we need the ratio of CL over CD to be maximum. At the given flight speed, CL has to have a certain value for the L over W equation to hold. And CD has two components. CD0 is constant, but CDI depends on CL. Therefore, for every flight speed, CL over CD has a certain value. And the CL over CD ratio makes a peak at a certain speed, and this speed corresponds to minimum TR. Okay? So, in fact, if you remember the previous example, that's what we saw already. So, we calculated all these values for two different values, for 30 meters per second and 50 meters per second. And, in the, and I said that if you keep doing that for other speeds as well, you find CL value and CD value for each flight speed. And then the, their ratio, the, also there's a ratio of these two numbers for each flight speed. And in this example, if you plot the ratio, uh, this is what you get. And on this, for this example, we see that the maximum is obtained here. Okay, so the maximum happens to be achieved at somewhere around 50 meters per second for this aircraft. 
so this was obtained by uh, calculation of CL and CD values at different flight speeds. But instead of doing that, we can just find this peak value immediately without having to calculate all these values. And let me talk about how we do that. Okay. Okay, let me just insert a new page here. Okay. Uh, We are looking uh, for the um, condition where CL over CD ratio becomes maximum. This can be found by using the Drag polar relation as follows. Okay, so I can write CL or CD, and I can write it as CL is just uh, CL is just itself. But instead of CD, I write CD zero plus K times CL squared, okay, and uh, then I I find the maximum value of this CL over CD ratio. So what I do is I differentiate this uh, expression with respect to CL and equate that to zero. So let, let me show you what you get here. So you differentiate the numerator, the, you get one. I multiply it with the denominator, CD zero, plus KCL squared. So this is what I'm uh, doing here, I'm calculating this, uh, taking this derivative here, okay, and then uh, minus the numerator itself directly CL, and then I differentiate the denominator, and differentiating the denominator gives me 2 times K times CL, and I divide this by the, the, the square of the denominator, which is CD0 plus KCL squared and then there's also the square of that. Okay? So now you should see that this is a quantity which is always positive, right? So you, you're taking the square of something and that something is the direct coefficient which is always a positive number. So it can never be zero or negative. So this is always positive. Um, and if I want to equate this to zero, then it is sufficient if I just equate the numerator of this thing to zero. Um, so let me do that. Let me take the numerator. Uh, so this thing is equal to zero is what I'm looking for. And this gives me CD zero plus KCL squared, but I have two KCL squared from here. And in the end I get K times CL squared minus K CL squared, and this will be equal to zero. So from here I get that K CL squared is equal to CD zero. So let me make up some space here by uh, shifting them upwards. Okay, but if you look at this, you will see that this is nothing but the in this direct coefficient, okay?
so for the lift to drag ratio uh, to be maximum induced drag coefficient should be equal to the parasite drag coefficient therefore we can easily find the minimum thrust required point if we know the um, parasite drag coefficient Okay, so if you if you're wondering what uh, the minimum thrust required value is, I can just um, do that quickly as follows. Equal to the drag force, uh, the minimum drag, and that's equal to one over two times rho times v squared times s times c d zero plus c d, but c d is equal to c d zero plus CDI, uh, but for the, this minimum condition, CDI should be equal to CD0, as you see here. So that means it should be equal to CD0, and the minimum required thrust then becomes rho times V squared times S times CD0. Okay, so this is the, the minimum thrust required value uh, for an aircraft. Okay, so this is what we have for today. So let me just stop here, and on Friday I will continue with uh, the subject of um, the trust required.